Revelation chapter 1 and uh, verse 9. I, I found it very interesting as I was just going back and reading some more this week. I, uh, I actually found a verse-by-verse uh, a, um, verse series preaching through and commentary series by uh, the late and, and a great preacher by the name of W.A. Criswell. Uh, he was the pastor of a little struggling small church in Dallas, Texas of about 65,000 people or so. And I didn't even know it existed. I came upon it on Amazon and I, I got it in and I thought, man, this is great. I got it. It's about, I'm kidding. It's about that thick. I mean, it's just huge. And I'm looking at that thing. I'm going, man, this is cool. I can't wait to steal some of his points and make sure they're mine and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And as I opened it up, Steve, and I looked at the chapter, I hadn't read it. I just opened up this morning just to kind of look through it real quickly. I was just doing some devotions. It's on the first chapter. He preached 19 sermons on the first chapter. So when you all think I preach a long time through a book, I'm only doing three sermons on the first chapter. 19, I about passed out. Now I got to go out there and find all the other volumes because I'm going, if I've only got volume one, it's only one chapter. Lord, have mercy. Am I going to be able to find them? But understand, there is so much meat in this book. We could be here 10, 11 years and still not exhaust it all. It's written to change our perspective. It's written to get us out of time and focused again once on eternity. It is written, there are solemn warnings about what's going to happen to the lost. Revelation is a book that tells you what's going to happen to the lost and what is coming. We all know what took place on September 11. There were 19 terrorists, four planes, twin towers of the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and an open field. Nearly 3,000 people would lose their lives. Now, what if for just a moment you had known about all of that with absolute certainty on September 10, 2011? What if you'd gotten information on the afternoon of September 10, 2001, about what was going to happen the next morning? What if your wife or your son or your mother or your brother-in-law was going to be on one of those planes? Would you not do absolutely everything within your power to use the information that you had received to help people to avoid the fiery devastation and destruction that was coming? Listen, all the antennas up. Something is coming that is going to be infinitely worse than 9-11. Eternally worse. The judgment of God is going to hit this planet one day. God has given information in the past. That information has helped people escape the coming destruction. And there have been times when people made powerful use of what God revealed about the future. What if God chose to use your pain or your discomfort to get that message out? Listen, last verse of what we studied last week. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye shall see him. Boy, sounds great, doesn't it, Dave? It sounds really good. Even those who pierced him and all of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, come Lord Jesus, amen. The, the judgment of God when it falls upon this planet is infinitely worse, eternally worse than anything that we've ever seen. And we know it's coming and we've got to get the message out. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we can face suffering. We can face imprisonment. We can face testing. We can face tribulation without fear. The resurrection of Jesus guarantees that though we may suffer, we will not be crushed. Though we are tested, we will not fail. And though we face tribulation, we will be preserved. Though we die, we are going to rise one day. 
Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and in the patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. We, we would say the A through the Z. And it's just not to make a blanket statement. Here's what he's saying. Whatever, you're, whatever the A through the Z, whatever letters you use to put any kind of thought together, I'm over all of it. And if I'm left out of it, you are left out of it. So I'm just not an afterthought. I'm just not some guy that's saying I'm the grand poobah. Anything that you can think up in rational thought and put a word and sentence together, I ought to be included in it because that's who I am. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, John, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now, let's kind of walk through this verse by verse by ju for just a moment, and then we'll, we'll draw some uh, four points off of it, and we're done. When we look at what John is saying, John comes on the scene, and he says, listen, he doesn't use his apostolic authority. Uh, he, he's not into titles. What John understood, what, what we must understand, is that our testimony is much more important than a title. And John understood it, and so he calls himself a brother. We're brothers in Christ. I'm a part of the royal family of God, and I'm a part of this great kingdom that God is building now and is going to establish as he comes back to this earth to sit upon the throne of David once again for all of eternity. I'm a part of the patience in waiting. Oh, the tribulation, the the, unlike the Roman Empire and the, the Pax Romana, which promised peace but delivered nothing but brutality and fear, the kingdom of God promises tribulation, and it promises to deliver us with confidence from that because we have eternal salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, John makes it clear why he is on the Isle of Patmos. Now, remember, Patmos is a little salt mine. It's a volcanic island. It's about 45 miles west, due west of Ephesus, which was John's own headquarters. And he has been banished to this six-mile by 10-mile salt mine. And there he has been banished to spend out the rest of his days uh, serving the Roman Empire as a slave until he dies from the labor, the exhaustion, or he just simply dies from old age. John is there on Patmos because of nothing that he did wrong, but because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, Christians are already under tremendous persecution, but a guy comes to, an emperor comes to the throne by the name of uh, Diocletian, and Diocletian was uh, the first, not well, not the first to call himself that, that he was Lord, but he was the first to enforce it. And if you would not bow and call him Lord, if whatever town you lived in, if you did not go to the marketplace and the place set up there or uh, maybe to the arena and or to where they did dramas and plays, every year... You were, you were required to go there, and you were required to light an in, uh, a candle and burn incense, and in doing so, you just simply knelt one knee down, and you declared, Caesar is Lord. Caesar Diocletian is Lord. And John said, no, 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 no. we're not doing that. And because of it, uh, and through, again, I think the providential care of God, uh, he is not executed as many of the other disciples have been, John is banished. Uh, John was one of the most popular at the time, and I'm assuming I'm going to read in a little bit of history. It's not recorded, but Diocletian thought, you know, uh, let's just get rid of him. I'm not going to make a martyr out of him and give them somebody else to rally around. Let's just put him out on an island somewhere, and in six months, he'll be a forgotten afterthought. 
and he'd probably be dead anyway. He's mid-90s. He's an old guy. He's not going to make it. He's going to work under forced labor. He's going to sleep on the ground on the stone. That's what he's going to, at 90 years of age, he's going to do it. How would you like that bed? I wouldn't. Man, I complain about my, my bed that flips my legs up in the air and puts my head up and down. You all right? Just a little bit spoiled. He wouldn't bow and proclaim him emperor or Lord. He's exiled. He's there. Listen, this is as real and as brutal as suffering can get. Volcanic salt mine, forced labor, sleep on the ground. You're alone. You're weary. You're exhausted, possibly forgotten. Get what I'm getting ready to tell you right now. John is the last left alive apostle and disciple and follow. Everybody else is gone. And Nero took care of both Paul and Peter some 20 years earlier. All the others have suffered just a horrific, horrific thing of brutally dying while they would confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but he's alone now. You're all that's left. Everybody else has been martyred. You are there suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, you will suffer in this lifetime, especially if you care about the lost. There will be suffering that comes. Uh, I'm never a prophet. I try not to be, but I'm 62, and if God gives me another 15 years to preach the gospel, I fully expect within those 15 years to probably have to go to jail. This is where our nation is moving. And today we have to embrace everything, everybody, and everyone. And the only person we're really not worried about offending is a child of God and a person that believes Jesus is Lord and Savior in this country. And so understand, it's going to come. We will suffer if we care about the lost, and everything is about the lost. Now, let me make a statement that's not in your notes, and we're ready to fill in some blanks. Listen, the less that we expect to suffer, the more devastating suffering becomes when it hits us. The less we expect to suffer, the more devastating it will become when the suffering hits us. It could be physical suffering, spiritual suffering, imprisonment. But when the let's, let, let's just do something again because I really want to help us understand something real quickly. Would you look at your neighbor and just confess this to them? I'm going to die. Now look at them right now. now I, I'm going to die. And some of you are going with my wife's cooking. I'll get there sooner than them. Now, listen, all of us are going to die, folks. Every one of us is going to go through the valley of the shadow of death unless Jesus returns because one out of one dies. So we've got to get in my mind and our vocabulary that death is a part of the reality of living. It can hit the young. It can hit the old. It can hit unexpectedly. It could linger for years. But it's coming. And so, the more that we understand that, boy, death is a part of the curse and death is a part, tragically, oxymoron, a part of life, then we begin to understand that there is a plan to take us off of earth into heaven. It's God's plan. Then we begin to embrace the fact that as J Jesus said to John, listen, I am he who lived, I, I, behold, I was alive, and now I am alive, and I have the keys of what? Death, hell, and the grave. I've got them. Take great solace in that fact. So, but the less we expect any suffering in our life, including the loss of loved ones, the more devastating the suffering is when it comes to us because we don't really understand that we're under a cursed system, our bodies are cursed, and sometimes God just may pick you out to pick on you. He has that right, potter, clay. Now, I don't like it. I've told God several times I don't like his plan. The last four or five months, I haven't liked anything of his plan. And aren't you glad he, God doesn't care about me on that point? It's not that he don't care. He just says, Tom, you just got to get over yourself. 
understand I've got a plan and it's all coming to me. But the less we expect to suffer, the more devastating suffering becomes when it takes place. Oswald Chambers, great in his devotion, uh, my utmost first highs. Listen, to choose suffering makes no sense at all. But to choose God's will in the midst of suffering makes all the sense in the world. So we're going to suffer. We're going to go through tribulation. We are going to get sick. Our loved ones are going to get sick. People are going to die. It's just, it's going to happen. I don't cherish it, but it shouldn't come and take us by surprise because it's going to happen. Now, let's talk uh, in your notes about the source of storms. The source of storms in your life, and we're going to focus on one particular storm, the storm that John is on right now. But there's the source, and in and, and three ways. Uh, first of all, there's the storms that we cause. Secondly, there are storms that others cause. So we either cause them or other people cause them. And then there are storms that God causes and God chooses for us to go through. Uh, those sometimes are the most difficult for us to understand. Uh, I can talk to myself, and many times I'll talk to God in the midst of the storm, and I don't feel like he's around, and I'm alone. Now, in your notes, number one, about storms, we're going to focus on the storm that God causes because uh, John is on a salt mine, and God calls that storm. God allowed the best that he had to be exiled for a year and a half. Now, we don't know if John made converts on Patmos. I like to think that he did. We don't know if he was given a time where he could, to, could address prisoners or talk to them, on it, but I would like to think he did. But here's the, here's the guy that would write, what, uh, five books to us, the Gospel of John, Revelation in first, second, and third, and for a year and a half, he's on an island somewhere, isolated from the world, can't preach a sermon, can't go to a new city and tell people about Christ, and he's the best that God's got. And God chose his best to pick on, to use him as an example to others. So in your notes, we never know ahead of time the plans God has for us. We don't know those. And the classic example there is Job, but for the sake of time, I don't have time. Uh, it's a classic passage. I encourage you to read it on yourself. But we don't know ahead of time. Now, four things I just want you to be able to check off. That's why we put a box there. Check it off. The storms of life are reality. Check mark number one. I got it. Storms are going to happen. I might cause them. All right. My wife might ask me, as she did this last week when we were out shopping, she's trying something on. Honey, does this make me look fat? Okay. The answer, guys, is always no. Any other answer uh, borders on gross stupidity. Okay? So understand, I can cause that storm. All right? And so, or ladies, don't ever make us choose between two. I mean, that's like the, you talk about the valley of the shadow of death. Because you don't want to know which one makes me look better. Then you want to know why this one makes me look better than that one. And all he's trying to do is get out of the room. But there are storms we cause. The storms of life are a reality. Others cause them. You've worked hard. You've raised your kids right. And one day your kid walks in and says, I'm pregnant. There's a storm others have caused. It's entered your life. How are you going to handle it? All right, then check mark. The storms of life are designed for spiritual growth. You need to check that off. God is not guilty of child abuse ever. The storms are to promote you spiritually, not to do you harm on this planet. Okay? That's why uh, John could begin this, hey, grace to you and uh, peace. Uh, did, he, did he use the Hebrew word there? Why didn't he go use shalom? Well, it's a typical, everybody understood. No, he, he used the word irene, which is peace and that's, that has the result of contentment in your life. God's looking just not to say hello. God's wanting to do something in you that produces contentment all of your life, no matter what storm you're going through. Check mark number three, the storms of life come when I am outside the known will of God. Yep. When I walk outside the known will of God, storms are coming, get ready for it. 
God loves you so much. He will ask, then he will seek, and then he will knock. And when you get to the knocking stage, it's intense. Okay, same three words we use for prayer, the same three words God uses, Jesus uses about suffering. I'll ask you to come home. I'll come looking for you and ask you to come home. Then I'll cause something to run into you that'll bring you home. Am I okay? This is real preaching. Last but not least, and this is the one you got to understand, the storms of life come when I am inside the known will of God. Remember the disciples? Jesus walks on the water. Who told the disciples to get in the boat and go across the river or the lake? The, the, Jesus. They were doing exactly what the master told them, exactly what the master said to do. They did, and now they're in the midst of a storm in the middle of the lake, and they're getting ready to go down, and Jesus comes walking on the water. Didn't do anything wrong, perfectly in the will of God, and storms started coming. John was there because he preached God's word, and he continued to testify. It was something that's a linear. He just, he just kept on telling people, I've seen the reason, risen Savior. He is Lord. I'll never bow to an earthly potentate or king. Jesus is Lord. Secondly, a vertical perspective will keep us from horizontal panic. A vertical perspective will keep me from horizontal panic. Anything I can see through these eyes and all the scenarios I can create up in my mind, if A happens, then B will happen, and we'll get C. All of a sudden, the enemy starts running through my mind and my conscience, and everything is going crazy. And if I don't remember to look up, because my strength is coming from him, I will live a life of panic. And the old nasty stress word comes into my life. Remember the old songs we used to sing? Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loved me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. And then the verses start, it may be through the valleys. And it, just goes through, it just lists a whole bunch of stuff. That ain't really good. And yet for 40, 50 years of my life, we do it at invitation time. Wherever he leads, I'll go. And then he leads and we don't want to go. Understand, if I keep my eyes on Jesus, I'll begin to understand horizontally what's happening. Uh, there's a scripture there, Philippians 1.29. It says this, for to you it has been granted that was to receive a gift. On behalf of Christ, listen, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's been given to you as a gift to suffer. Well, you imagine Christmas coming up. We got all kinds of gifts here. They're all around. And one of those gifts that God wraps, when I take the bow off of it, it's called suffering. I don't know about you, I'd be doing what my wife does and all my grandkids do and my grown daughters still do. They'll get under the tree, shake them babies. How heavy is it? Everything, they want to know what's inside that. They're trying to guess. Listen, I probably wouldn't open any gifts if I knew one of them had suffering in it. I'd probably just say, no, thank you. But see, we don't, we don't get that choice. Uh, suffering is a required course. It's not something you test out of or opt out of. But when I keep my eyes on Jesus, it's amazing what can happen. Number three, the filling of the Holy Spirit is what enables us to endure the storms that God causes. There's only one thing, and that's the filling of the Holy Spirit. You imagine you're on a salt mine, you're all by yourself. You know, the three famous things we would be saying, why me, why now, why this? Everybody okay? You've said them, I've said them. Here's John looking around. Everybody's gone. All of his buddies, everybody's dead. I mean, they're dead. They're gone. Now he's forgotten. He's isolated on this island. And John just simply says, you know, I think we have church today. It's the Lord's day. And I was filled with the Spirit on the Lord's day. Listen to me. I've heard this terminology so much growing up as a kid. 
through all of ministry, now, and I hear it all the time when I'm in pastoral circles, that my church is dead. Are you listening to me? I've never pastored a dead church. You want to know why? Because when I come to this building on Sunday morning, I'm going to be filled with God's Spirit. I'm going to bring the Spirit of God into this place with me. I don't care what anybody else does. And listen, can I tell you how I know God's going to use this sermon? When I got out of my car this morning, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit that God was going to do something special today. So I come expecting that I teach my staff religiously. If no one else comes filled with the Spirit, you come that way. Walk in filled with God's Spirit, ready to worship God, ready to receive a word from God. I don't care what happened in your week, this, in your life this last week. I'm telling you, John, on the Lord's Day said we're going to have church. And because of it, we've got the book of Revelation today. All because an old guy on a salt mine somewhere said, hey, it's time to worship. I can worship him from the salt mine. The most precious psalms that we have of David, you know where they were written? In a cave. When he was hiding either from Saul and nor his own son Absalom who was trying to kill him. And he wrote some of the greatest psalms that we cherish today because he chose to be filled with, listen, you can choose right now to be filled with the Holy Spirit and leave here in a position of victory. Why? Because it's a grace provision. And you just say, okay, Lord, I'm going to stop looking horizontally. I'm going to put my eyes back on you. And since I got to go through this anyway, I'm going to try to see how many people I can tell about Jesus on the journey there. I got a brand new doctor. Dr. Ari thinks I'm nuts. And he ain't far off. <laughs> you all right? So I don't know how God's going to use what I'm going through. I don't know how God's going to use what you're going through. But listen, since you got to go through it, Go through it with him, not without him. All right, let's go. One more point. Um, I love the, I, I didn't put this in your notes, but Augustine of Hippo said this, God is, in, is an infinite circle whose center is everywhere and his circumference is nowhere. Isn't that a great thought? His center is everywhere, but he has no circumference. I'm just, that just blows me away. Sorry. Last but not least, number four, and this is one that you learn from John, and we have to learn it in our life. The message is Im Im more important than the messenger. The message is more important than the messenger. God took the best he had and isolated him, put him in harsh labor from what we can tell from history, 16 hours a day labor. Forced labor. Romans didn't care if you died or not. They'd just throw you in another pit over there and cover you up and put some dirt on you so the stench wouldn't smell. That's it. And you're there, and God is teaching John as he's teaching me that the message is much more important than the messenger. Now, when you embrace that point, uh, four or five bullet points are going to happen. So here we go. It'll never be boring. It's never boring. John said, I am going to patiently endure. I'm going to patiently and wait the coming of Jesus Christ. I'll never give up hope. Secondly, it will be different than you and I have ever pondered. God will think up something you couldn't have thought up, and you'll go through it. Different than you ever pondered. Tony, I never dreamed I'd get a call one day from a prison in Kentucky saying, your youngest daughter is in jail and she's asking you to come bail her out. And when you have to say to the, the guard, let her sit. I never pondered that path. Never came on my radar. Oh, I went and visited her, but I didn't bail her out. Am I okay? You know, you, you, I never, when I got married and had children, that wasn't on my agenda. So understand, it, it'll be different. It will be different than you, you and I have ever planned. Number four, it'll be different than you and I would have preferred. See the things, how many guys, listen, 
Guys, let's take a, let's take a survey real quickly. And I, I know you'll be honest with me. How many of you prayed this prayer over your family? God, if something bad's going to happen, let it happen to me. Just let it happen to me. And what happens when it doesn't happen to you? Is God still God? Is God still in control? Am I still supposed to trust him? Am I allowed to tell him I don't like his plan? Is he allowed to say back to me, it's okay, I got it under control? Mm -hmm. So understand, this suffering John's going through, he can walk through it with the Holy Spirit, and because he chose to, by the way, he left the Isle of Patmos and went into the third heaven. All because he decided to have a worship service day. John clung to Christ's promise to return and his promised abiding presence. He clung to the promise that he was going to return, but he also clung to the fact that he heard Jesus say, I will not leave you comfortless. I'll never leave you as an orphan. My presence will always remain with you if you're following and you're a part of the fruit of the Spirit. Father, take this simple message, drive it home, change lives today. Lord, I believe you changed decisions that maybe people are going to make today. And they said, no, 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 I'm back in God's word. I, I'll never make that choice. Maybe, maybe you gave hope to somebody today that they could be forgiven of their past and that you'd be with them in their future. Maybe you'll use this to heal a home today, a marriage today. Father, I, I, sometimes I don't get to see the fruit of a message, but I know, I know when you got it, and I know, God, when you're going to use it. And I thank you. Change lives, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me, if you will.